<sighs> Star Trek IV, the movie where the crew of the Enterprise travels 300 years back in time to bring back two whales so they can communicate with an alien spaceship that only speaks whale. Yep, whale. They speak whale. Fascinating. <laughs> it's a fun movie, but come on, what were they smoking? On the other hand, it was the 80s, so probably drugs were involved in the writing process. I could go on and on about how silly this movie is, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because of its effects, and Star Trek had plenty of effects. They had miniatures, sled scan effects, lots of blue screenshots. Water tanks were also involved. They surely used every effect in the book, but there's one effect in particular that I want to highlight, and it's not any of the ones I've already mentioned. This effect is used in the time warp sequence and is one of the first times we see 3D scanning in movies. Actually, Star Trek IV is the very first movie to use 3D scanning. ILM, the company behind the effects, used this new for the time technology to scan the heads of the Star Trek crew in order to create a surrealistic dreamlike sequence. Let's see how they managed to pull it off. Back in the mid 80s, computer graphics was in its infancy. 3D modeling wasn't as advanced, so in order to get a 3D model that was realistic, the best approach was to digitize the actual object or a sculpt of the object. To do that, artists would use a digitizer pen and they would slowly go through the surface of the object, scanning its different parts. Usually the surface had a pre-drawn grid, which essentially corresponded to the wireframe of the final 3D model. A point on that pre-drawn grid corresponded to a vertex on the wireframe of the 3D model. As you can imagine, this was a tedious process, but it ensured that the 3D model would look realistic and not like a rough representation of the real thing. For a model as complex as a head though, ILM decided to go a different route. They decided to work with CyberWord Laboratory, which had a brand new laser scanning system. This system allowed them to scan the actors directly, which made the process faster and less tedious. So for Star Trek, what we did is we went down to this company that's in Monterey, and they have a system that uses a video camera and two light sources. And the, the two light sources shine on the head of the subject being digitized. This is Leonard Nimoy. And they create a profile of light on his head. And the camera can see that and digitize that profile. Now, Leonard Nimoy is on a, a little ro rotating turntable there. So as he turns around, you get a profile of every point on his head. Because the technology was quite new and they didn't know if the scan data was going to work with ILM's proprietary systems, they also produced styrofoam sculpts based on that scanned data. So if things failed, they could digitize the sculpts by hand. The whale sculpt shown on the sequence was also scanned, but it didn't use cyberware's scanning process. Instead, it was digitized by hand. It's quite fascinating to see how a silly movie like Star Trek IV used technology that for the time was on the cutting edge. Since then, things have advanced by leaps and bounds, but still, it's quite impressive to see. The lack of resolution is obvious, but this is where we see one of the differences between VFX artists of that era and VFX artists of our time. To overcome the technical limitations, VFX artists and directors of that era had to think creatively and make the best out of the limited resources they had. Instead of trying to create an ultra-realistic time-traveling sequence that would instantly fail to convince anyone, they went with a more surrealistic, dreamlike approach. So even though the technology wasn't up to par, the sequence feels more like a director's artistic interpretation of time travel. Indirectly, these Star Trek scans helped build the tools we use today. From time to time, Spock scan kept appearing in SIGGRAPH presentations to test new cleaning and upresing algorithms. I tried to find the mesh, but I didn't manage to get my hands on it. I didn't expect it to be an easy task, but it was worth the try. The Star Trek dream sequence took weeks to render. If you think about it, it's amazing how far we've come. Just 35 years ago, this sequence bogged down powerful computers of the time, and nowadays we can easily render that level of quality on our phones and in real time. 
Nowadays, 3D scanning has evolved quite a bit. We have incredibly advanced light stage rigs that can capture a 360 degree view of a subject in a matter of seconds. This rig has the ability to use 150 cameras that instantaneously capture images and lighting data. So an artist can get not only a production ready mesh, but also high resolution diffuse normal and displacement maps. Quite a big leap from Star Trek's modest 3D scans. Technology has evolved so much that I'm willing to bet I can get something similar to Star Trek's results right here in my studio, just using minimal equipment. Of course, there's no way I can compete with the professional setups used in uh, Hollywood productions, but getting Star Trek 4 results, it's probably doable. The problem with scanning people is that if you're not grabbing all the images instantaneously like they do with the professional light stages, you're introducing a whole lot of errors to your mesh. No matter how still you are, you will at some point make some micro movements. So what was a stretched scan area a couple of moments ago is now a much looser defined area. The other advantage of uh, shooting all angles at the same time is that VFX studios can capture more than just a neutral pose. They can have the character smiling, yelling, being sad, poses basically that will help the artist create realistic animations. I on the other hand will be shooting with one camera, so neutral pose it is. To get all the different angles, I'll imitate Star Trek's uh, setup, but it's going to be a lower budget version of it. Instead of a rotating base, I'll use my desk chair. <laughs> Close enough. I won't bother with uh, cross-polarizing the light, I just want to first see if I can actually get anything usable. I'll trigger the camera with my phone, and thankfully I can also do the same with focus, so that's definitely going to help a lot. So let's see how things turned out. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for our first try, I guess it's kinda okay. But I think the Star Trek capture <laughs> is better. I don't really understand why the surface is so uneven. The beard part, I get. But the actual face, I don't understand what's going on. It's so bumpy. I guess it didn't have enough information to work with, or was it the other way around, that the pores and small details confuse the photogrammetry algorithm? I, I'm not sure. The eyes I kinda expected to be wonky, my eyelids were probably moving quite a bit throughout the rotation, and the eyelashes are super tiny details considering I didn't shoot any close-ups. The glossiness of the eyes probably also tripped things up. For a first try I guess it's okay, but I want to see if I can improve things, so here's the plan. I'm not going to shoot and pose at the same time, it's just incredibly difficult to do. So for the second try I'll use a friend as a model. This will help me focus on capturing good images and also more close-ups so I can get more details on the mesh. We shot the images in the evening so there wasn't any natural light to fill in the shadows. I'm just using one light and as a result the images have a lot of shadows. I also didn't want to use long exposure times since I'm dealing with a moving subject. As a result, everything in the image is a bit underexposed. But on the bright side, the light is cross-polarized, and I also shot way more images and a few close-ups for extra detail. So here's the final result. The model is definitely more detailed than the one I shot of myself, but still the whole skin is super bumpy. But for sure the extra shots and the fact that I took more care in grabbing the pictures paid off. All features are much more defined, the eyes are for sure more defined, and the same goes for the lips. The ears kinda look the same to me, but I think it's because most of the times they were in the shadow, so there's not much more to capture there. With some smoothing applied, the capture feels much more defined and cleaner than my self-portrait. Is it better than Star Trek 4? Probably not, but it's still quite amazing to see how much we can do in our homes with really basic equipment. Something that was cutting edge 30 years ago can now be easily achieved in a tiny fraction of the budget and with relative ease. And I cannot imagine how much we'll be able to do in 10 or 20 years from now. I definitely want to see how much more I can improve face capturing, so expect to see more experiments from me in the future. But for now, that is it for this video. Let me know what you thought of the scans. Were they better than Star Trek's? <laughs> I don't think they were, but let me know if I'm not seeing things correctly. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.